come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, we are here for love, for the love of God, for the love of Brad, for his love for us. And we are here for each other, making a sacred and safe place for each of us to come as we are with all that we're feeling and know that we are not alone. So let us surrender ourselves to love and to the one who was and is and always will be. Friends, I'll invite you to sing along to Let It Be. Myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking.
Will you pray with me? Beloved, the psalmist declares how often you weep with compassion over those who are crushed in spirit. Though we are beset with many fears that cause illness and troubles, you are ever ready to comfort us in our sorrows and strengthen us on our soul's journey to wholeness. Renew our lives today, we pray, for the living and loving to which we are called. Amen. Reading from James 3, verses 3 to 18. Do you want to be counted wise to build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourselves sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish plotting. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at the other's throats. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next and not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor.
Brad. Brad was always Bradley boy to me. Um, I'm going to do a remembrance of his life because we all know him from all different stages of life. Maybe all of the years or part of the years, but I was, or Brad was nine when I was born. So the early years when he was born in June of 1970, he was the first for mom and dad, and the first grandchild. So we all know how that goes. He got so much love, so many pictures, oh, so many memories. Oh, yes. Um, as mom would say, he was the baby by the book. First steps at one, and kind of just did everything just how you're supposed to. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, through his early childhood, he loved being outside, always playing outside, whether that was baseball or riding bikes or just playing on swings and being outside, and of course, soccer. I think a lot of us know that soccer was in his heart from an early, early age, and he loved that. He continued to play soccer in high school, where he had the wonderful 80s high school hairdo of the mullet, and it was fantastic. Drove a Camaro, lived life to its fullest, had lots of memories, um, just always still with serving and being with people and being a lifeguard where he played with so many kids out at the pool. Um, gosh, and then on to college where he continued to play soccer at Manchester and where one Jan term he traveled to Europe and he met Connie and what a blessing that was. And they've had so many happy years together and they built a lot of memories through Manchester where he played soccer, was in theater, wasn't, I don't think he was afraid to be on stage. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to do that, which is amazing, amazing. And Brad and Connie got married, um, I have to look at my dates, 1995, June 24th. What a happy day, just amazing, uh, full of a room like this around lots of love and support and um, it's a beautiful day where then they honeymooned to Europe and backpacked and stayed in hostels and all kinds of fun. Um, they continued to travel here and there through the years. Uh, their first move was to Boston um, where he worked at the New England Center for Children and just continued his love for kids and being with kids and, and helping others. As we've all said, Brad and Connie's house was always open to anybody. You just never knew when you arrived who may be sleeping on the couch or passing through. They always had so many loved people 
that were passing through their life and, and they were spending time with. Um, then they moved on to Chicago and then to South Bend and then built their home in Niles where I know they did so much work on their house and Brad loved every minute of it, um, doing lots of work and loved the land. He loved planting and watching things grow and even today, um, just the other day, we were out in the orchard picking wonderful peaches that he had planted and just those remembrances of small things like that that he so loved. Um, he loved having Sophia and Harper and being at home with them and spending so much time with them. He, I think he definitely really, really enjoyed being with you guys and having all of those days with you. And, oh goodness, and just continuing by coaching, I'm sure some of you maybe you either played soccer with Brad or your kiddos were coached by Brad or probably saw him here or there um, on the soccer field because that's something he really loved. And um, basketball, he coached basketball too. And as his true Indiana roots can <laughs> keep that basketball. And just uh, last year was able to continue the dream of, we all grew up up at Pine Lake and he loved going there on the weekends and they were able to have a cottage up there and spend some time on the water and um, just so many happy memories on the water up there. Um, he worked at Clubhouse here in, in St. Joe County and continued to, to love people well and serve the community and just, I don't know, Brad had such a big heart. He just continued to love and love and love. So, thank you.
I'm reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 21 and 24 to 38. Coming down off the mountain with them, he stood on a plain surrounded by disciples and was soon joined by a huge congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem, even from the seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon. They had come both to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. Those disturbed by evil spirits were healed. Everyone was trying to touch him, so much energy surging from him, so many people healed. <clears throat> then he spoke. You're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry, then you're ready for the messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. But it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life is all fun and games. There's suffering to be met, and you are going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more payback. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of, of pawnbrokers do that. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, you be kind. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life. You'll find life given back, but not merely given back. Given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. Thank you, Mark. One need not spend much time reading through scripture to, dec to discover Brad. I know that's sort of a funny thing to say. I can't recall a time I ever heard Brad quoting from scripture. He didn't wear his faith on a sleeve. And I've got a ton of Bible translations in my study and none of them has Brad in them. I'm talking about Brad's spirit. It's all through scripture. And probably some of the theologians or clergy here are thinking I've got it backwards. And maybe I do. Maybe it's not Brad's spirit in scripture, but the spirit we hear in scripture that lived in Brad. Take your pick. Either way, if you, know, if you knew Brad, I still say you'll find him in there. Didn't James 3 hit the Brad nail on the head? That was a carpenter joke. <laughs> Real wisdom, James says, looks like the humility and gentleness and mercy that draws people into healthy relationships and communities of true belonging. 
That's Brad. That's what he did with his family, his church, his co-workers. In Luke chapter 6, hit it too, with Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. When Jesus talks about loving the unlovable, taking the initiative with generosity, treating others like you'd like to be treated yourself, it just rings with the spirit each of us knew in Brad. I could keep going. Brad's all through the Gospels, encouraging the brokenhearted, poking fun at the pompous. He's giving all that he can to those in need, and he's setting a table for company that many people wouldn't talk to, let alone break bread with. But we're not here to find Brad in the Bible. We're here to comfort each other in our heartache. We're here to remind each other of how we've seen the spirit of life and love flowing through our dear brother Brad and how that very same spirit is trying to flow through us. Will we let it? I know it's tempting to say, yes, we will. We all want to do right by Brad. He was an extraordinary man. He loved us with an extraordinary love. But I think so much of what made Brad special to us is that we were special to him. What I mean is that Brad found extraordinary people all around him. It's the way he was looking. All around him he saw people worthy of his full presence, people that made him smile and laugh and wonder and learn from and cry and reach out to comfort or encourage. Wherever he went, he noticed people that most of us miss. No one was a stranger to Brad. His openness, his smile was disarming. So I think what I'm trying to say is that it's easier to heap all this praise upon Brad than it is to choose to let that same animating spirit of life and love th flow through us as it did Brad, right? I guess that's sort of obvious. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty obvious how different our world would be right now, how different our community would be right now if each one of us here, whose hearts are aching over losing Brad, could somehow open ourselves to being like Brad. To that, to that same way of being. It's infectious. And isn't that the kind of infection, isn't that the kind of pandemic we'd like to be dealing with right now? An infectious spirit of Brad all over. So I want to leave time for us all to hear the stories and appreciations that you have to share. We'll have some extended time for family and for, for you who wish to, to come up here and share or we'll have a handheld mic we can bring around. But I want to take just a moment to share something that's hurting for me right now and also to share what's giving me hope. Some of you knew Brad was hurting. Some of you may have sensed it. A few of you know he struggled with de depression and anxiety. And he was receiving treatment for bipolar disorder. And it wasn't as effective as it needed to be. And this cursed pandemic didn't help anything either, either. Brad's last few months were a real roller coaster. And they took a toll on his health, on his mental and his physical health. He wasn't himself. And he didn't fully know how to let people in. This man who was so good at being gentle and caring and fun was hurting and the people who were closest to him were trying to help him. And Brad was trying to overcome it. And we thought we had more time. In the end, his health failed. And we can take a measure of comfort from knowing that he didn't take his own life. That he was still trying to get better. That he did want to live. That he didn't want to leave us. It's always hard to lose loved ones. It's harder when we don't get to say goodbye. It's even harder when we're carrying those burdens on our own. And friends, I believe Brad is now at peace.
I believe Brad's soul is no longer frightened for those who loved him to know he was hurting. I believe Brad now longs for each of us to be able to comfort each other through the things that are complicating our grief. And I believe Brad now wants no one to suffer, never did want anyone to suffer in their depression or anxiety alone, and wants each of us to grow in our awareness of those in pain in our presence for people in need. So I take hope in seeing your love for Brad and his family firsthand. You are amazing. So many of you have gone through your own grief and loss and know how exhausting, how overwhelming, how frightening it can be. But yesterday and in, in each of the days of this week, I have seen waves of love and support washing over Brad's family, his close friends. I take hope from the ways you're reaching out to support them. I take hope from the stories I hear people share about how Brad became their role model in life, the person they wanted to be like. How many of us know of people like that for our own lives, right? I find hope in the relationships that Brad strengthened wherever he lived or worked or played. And he strengthened a lot of relationships through his play. It was sacred. It was holy work. I smile when I remember the fun my children had playing with them. The pure joy of seeing Brad and knowing he was there for you. I laugh out loud as people recall Brad helping people not take themselves too seriously. I think you'll hear some stories. Friends, this is a day to give thanks for the love we've known in Brad. He brilliantly bore the light of our beloved. It is a day for us to share how his light and love has inspired and changed each of us. It's a day for us to consider how Brad's eternal spirit might guide us in the days and years to come. And it's a day to lay aside our regrets. Not to deny them, but to learn from them and allow God's healing grace to flow through us so we might be able to extend that grace and that healing power to others. It is a day to acknowledge that Brad's spirit on this earth will flow through the love we share with each other. Amen.
Times like this are revealing and humbling. I've been stunned many times in the last week, most recently by the deluge of support we've received. First, thanks to Clay Church for hosting us unexpectedly. Pastor Brian Durand and team immediately opened their doors and hearts to us so we had enough space to celebrate Brad's life, and we're grateful to be able to gather together here. Thanks to Doug and Karen and Troy and Sarah and their families for loving and supporting the girls, even in their own grief. Thanks to my sister Elaine and brother-in-law Mark for doing just about everything. They killed hornets, they asked hard questions, they listened, they hosted Doug and Karen when the power went out at their house. Thanks to Brenda for hopping on the first plane out of Minneapolis to spend her big birthday week by my side. She said nope to me at all the right times. Thank you, Karen and Kimberly and everyone who wrote, called, stopped by, fed us, hugged us, and just loved on us. I'll never know how much Prince of Peace members and others did behind the scenes. Thank you to everyone who came today. You came from Wyoming, Los Angeles, and Ripon, California, Seattle, South Bend, Louisville, North Carolina, Elkhart, Bay Ridge, Minneapolis, North Manchester, Iowa, Ohio, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Jersey, Fort Wayne, Chicago, Fishers, Notre Dame, Lloyd Lane, and so many other places. Got a hug from Chris Palladino by others from Colorado. Thanks for coming from everywhere to show your love, even online right now. Thank you all as well. We feel it, yeah. and we thank you. Finally, I wanna thank Pastor Ken. I thought I knew you, Ken, <laughs> since we go all the way back to college, uh, but your accompaniment to this process has been incredible. He helped us talk and cry and laugh for four hours on Tuesday night, and that was incredibly helpful for all of us. And Brad considered you a good friend, so you too did that through your own grief. So thank you all. So I want to talk to my girls first, but I want you all to bear witness to that. Sophia and Harper, I knew you were amazing girls before Dad died, but I have come to know you in a whole new way through this process of grieving. The process is forged and revealed the depth of your souls and your stunning, the good stunning. Both such beautiful hearts filled with grace and love, so much of that comes from your dad. 
so much. Brad wasn't driven to define who he was by his job titles and profession. He had a thousand jobs. The job that mattered most to him was being your dad. He cared about that more than anything. And he did his best to teach you kindness, selflessness, joy, and wonder. He loved you with all his heart. So this room is filled with pastors and priests, so I'm going to let them frame this in theological terms. I'm I'm trained in literature and writing, so I'm going to talk to you the way that makes sense to me, and that's through story. I've been thinking about Brad's life as a book with different chapters, and I wasn't present for all of those chapters, so I need your help telling the story. I'm a teacher, too, so I'm going to make you participate. Chapter 1, Birth and Youth in Elkhart, Indiana. Raise your hand if you met Brad the day he was born or in the first few weeks of his life. Yeah, uncles, aunts, family, friends, Clarks, loads of Clarks. I'm told he was a perfect baby, and we have pictures of a plump, smiling baby Brad to prove it. Raise your hand if you knew Brad from birth to 18 years old. So family friends, high school friends, Elkhart in the house here showing up. I see younger family members, I see high school friends, we teachers, teammates troublemakers out there who knew him in high school. Quake Pletcher, Derek Bell, Troy Mick maybe a little bit. Quake again. Those young years were good but difficult as Brad had learned to navigate some physical challenges. He had cable braces on his legs and Coke bottle thick glasses to correct terrible vision. But the story is that he overcame those challenges and strengthened himself through physical activity, swimming, baseball, wrestling, and of course, his beloved soccer. So many people coached him formally, including his dad. And of course, his mom coached and cheered from the sidelines there for every win and loss. Pine Lake in Plainwell, Michigan was a huge part of his youth. Raise your hand if you're part of the Pine Lake Brigade or my Pine Lakers. There they are. There they are. Brad spent many weekends with Karen's family there. Brad learned to ski and fish and have unbridled fun with family. His grandpa Melvin led the antics and became a formative figure in his life. Someone who taught Brad to be himself and have fun and applied duct tape to any problem. (laughs) Brad also learned to surf as a team and fell in love with the ocean. Doug, Karen, Troy, and Sarah Sarah and the family are are better able to narrate this part of his life. I just know he had a good childhood filled with exploration and family and love. Chapter 2, College, North Manchester. Raise your hand if you met Brad in college. Yeah. Yeah, all over, yeah. We all met Brad the same way at the dining hall. He worked as a card flipper. We had these physical cards with our photos and names showing that we purchased a meal plan. So the the card flipper was stationed at the front of the dining hall. And Brad prided himself on not having to ask people their names. He just somehow knew us all. You just stepped up and Brad flipped your card. He also worked in the dish room the stinky, nasty dish room. That might be why he became so focused on us not wasting food. (laughs) Everyone respected him for how he carried himself in both jobs, front and center smiling and behind the scenes scrubbing. He played soccer at Manchester. Raise your hand if you played soccer with Brad formally or informally at Manchester. Ken, Dan, Izzy and Joel, so many people. Yeah, so many. He loved Coach Good and the whole team. He struggled to determine what career path he wanted to take, moving from business to elementary education, maybe a few things in between. 
But some of his favorite classes were philosophy and art. I really got to know him when we enrolled in the 1993 January term course on theater in London. Professors Scott Strode and Dogney Babel led us through the streets of London and then into the countryside. Against his wishes, Brad was drafted to be a co-host of the morning show we produced as part of our communications media experience. But he wasn't afraid of anything. He just didn't have to be center stage. He was comfortable working behind the scenes. Chapter three, marriage. Raise your hand if you attended our wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Brad and I celebrate our first date as Groundhog's Day. We attended a Groundhog's Day party, as one does. <laughs> That's Manchester. <laughs> and we've been together ever since. I, would, I surprised Brad with Groundhog Bride and Groom cakes at our wedding in South Bend. Then we were off for a honeymoon backpacking trip through Europe. We had Eurorail passes, a guidebook, and Dan Smith's phone number in Wrocław, Poland. And that was our plan. <laughs> so, Doug and Karen made us get a couple nights in a hotel when we first got there. Thanks for, thank you for doing that. And then it was backpacking. In Europe, I witnessed Brad's sense of adventure and joy. We went to the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain, and it took all my strength to keep him on the safe side of the rails. <laughs> really wanted to do that. When we returned, Brad graciously deferred to my academic interests and we moved to Boston to start my grad school career, vowing never to return to Indiana. We then moved to Chicago for more of my grad work, then surprisingly to South Bend for what we thought would be a short stay. How many years ago? Brad loved the adventure of living in new places, finding new food and festivities and friends. Soccer and church were his ways of engaging those communities. He was our social director in those early years and we developed so many friendships through his genuine kindness and desire to know the people around him. Raise your hand if you are or were a neighbor of ours. Lloyd Lane, Country Knoll, Chicago, Boston, Pine, oh, Campbell's. Oh, yeah. I bet at some point Brad offered to help you with a project, lend you a tool, make a connection for you, or he talked your ear off when you were just trying to weed. He truly saw the people around him and reached out, just always looking to connect. Raise your hand if you worshiped with Brad at Prince of Peace or Crest Manor or just had a spiritual connection with him. Yeah. Brad was incredibly empathetic to the point that he took on the pain of the world. Church helped him hone that selflessness and channel that awareness of the world's pain into good works, big and small, from being a director for a session at Camp Mac to mentoring youth like Ben Kolda, to serving on the church board and much more. Church brought him peace. He was not a singer, not gonna lie, the mix aren't singers, except maybe for Sarah. She passed choir, I think. But he absolutely loved all the music in church. When Faith and Dan and Claire Stowe sang and played together, he was in heaven. Chapter four, work. Raise your hand if you worked with Brad in some way, somewhere. Clubhouse, Soccer Zone, Pier One, Mishawaka Parts, Philly Pretzel, Elkona Pool, New England Center for Autism, Michiana Echo Soccer Club, Compton Ice Arena, the Dining Hall, etc. Yeah. So many people, so many places. Work started for Brad in his youth in Elkhart. He worked a lot of dirty jobs, you know, factories, fields, dish rooms. He later found his calling as a teacher, but expressed that in many ways. He worked with kids on the spectrum in the New England Center for Autism, discovering his gift for working with just all kinds of people. Even when his job was managing stores or sports facilities, he was always teaching, reaching out to employees or customers who were struggling in some way and gently coaching them into success. 
Brad loved his current job at Clubhouse of St. Joseph County most of all. He felt a true sense of purpose just being present with people struggling with mental health. I don't think he was ever turned down from a job he interviewed for. If you met him, you hired him. <laughs> the change in jobs was hard on him and us in many ways, but it was a sign of his curiosity about life. He was eager to learn new things, meet new people, and discover more about himself. And although it wasn't a paid position, one of the most formative jobs Brad did was take care of my mother when she developed early Alzheimer's. Brad loved my mom so much, and she loved him. He was totally on board with having her live with us, knowing that he would do a lot of the day-to-day -day support. We decided to build a home that would work for that living situation, and Brad was the general contractor. Suddenly, he's a builder. He designed and touched every inch of our house inside and out. Hasn't fallen down. Guess he used enough duct tape. It's all good. Stands beautiful and strong 16 years later. Mom spent 10 and a half of those years with us, and he was a phenomenal caretaker and companion. She got endless joy seeing the trees plant Brad planted in the pond. Brad built, he built the play set and planted the orchard and created the fire circle and planted five acres of indigenous prairie grass and flowers and landscaped with Brent Campbell and so much more. He created a beautiful nest for us, and we feel wrapped safely in his arms in our home. Chapter 5, Fatherhood. Raise your hand if Brad was your dad. Not too many people can claim that. The happiest days of dad's life were our wedding day, the day Sophia was born, and the day Harper was born. The most important and best job Brad ever had was being your dad. He stayed home when you were young, and I worked outside the home because that's what he really wanted to do. He made homemade, homemade baby food for you and carried you around in that baby Bjorn carrier. Karen tells the story of coming to visit at Country Knowles, and he was making a fire in the fireplace, and then he turned around, and Sophia, with bright red cheeks, was just dangling from his front. He was kind of a dangerous dad. <laughs> you just had to do what he was doing, and he was always up to something, you know? He tried to socialize you with play groups. He often found himself, though, to be the only dad in the room of moms at those events. He loved going, but he also stepped back when he felt that difference made others uncomfortable. If there was a hands-on school project, he jumped in. Maybe a little too helpful sometimes. Let's just say the girls turned in some remarkable dioramas. <laughs> he built you so many weird, dangerous things. <laughs> the sled launch you, you saw there uh, stands out. We have a small hill, and Brad wanted to elevate our sledding game, so he started stacking things. And <laughs> Elaine, my safety sister, I can't believe you climbed that thing. That was crazy. <sighs> Dangerous dad. We've always said that I'm funny, but dad was fun, and that's way better. Dad did his best to love you and prepare you for life. He's gone too soon, but he packed a lot in those years with you. So hold on to those memories and keep listening to him. He had a lot to teach all of us about how to live a good life. Chapter 6, I don't want to title this one death, I want to call it Rebirth. Do not like how this story ended. But in writing this, I've come to realize that I'm only the narrator, not the author. God wrote this one, and I am not a fan of this chapter. I thought there were a lot more chapters ahead. A return to Pine Lake and Rest chapter, maybe a grandfather chapter, and others. But the story of Brad doesn't have to end. I don't want it to end. In fact, I need all of you to help me continue it. The girls need all of you to help me 
So I'm going to make one last request here and ask this of all of you. The girls' friends, our friends, the mixed friends and family, the Schaefer's family and colleagues, my colleagues, Brad's colleagues, our church family, everyone, everyone who's here, just going to ask you if you're willing to help these girls to continue to know their dad, continue to feel that love. Will you please just raise yourself up and stand up now and show them that you'll be here for them as you're able. Thank you. Thanks, Harper and Sophia. You, you got to help them too. A lot of people lost a good person. A lot. I love you, Brad. Thanks. So we're going to make some time for family members to share. Are you next, Sophia? Hi. <laughs> Um, I hope none of you ever find yourself in a position where you have to follow one of my mom's speeches. <laughs> uh, Dad was always so impressed with her writing and probably relieved that he was never the parent we asked to edit essays. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think I need to introduce myself after that, but I'm Brad's oldest daughter, Sophia. And I want to begin by thanking all of you for coming today to show your love for my dad and support for my family. It's hard to find the words to honor such an amazing man. He was goofy and loving and kind and so selfless each day. And I hope to follow the example he set throughout my life. His sense of humor never changed and could have just about anyone in tears. I've been amazed at how many people my dad has made an impact on and I appreciate each and every one of you that's reached out, whether you knew him well or not. A couple of people he went to college with have mentioned that there are some stories I probably shouldn't hear, and I expect those to come out today. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dad has always had a way with people. He was drawn to helping people, and it's something I've always admired about him. Uh, a couple months ago, we were in a restaurant, and there was a woman standing over his mother, her, her mother. <laughs> And Dad stood up suddenly and went to check on her. The tables around us were oblivious, but he stayed with them until an ambulance came a few minutes later. He was always on alert for people in need, and he was often to, the first one to sense that something needed, somebody needed him and respond. Dad had weird ways of showing us how much he cared about us. I didn't get to see him as often as I would have liked with our work and sleep schedules, but when I committed to Michigan State, we started getting these random unmarked packages at the front door. And Dad doesn't offer himself clothes, order himself clothes very often, but his closet now resembles the Michigan State bookstore. <laughs> One day I was being nosy and I opened an unmarked package and it was a, a state quarter zip clearly from the women's section, but it was Dad's, not mine. <laughs> I think he bought out the men's section and moved on to the women's. And he wore them all, <laughs> sometimes at the same time. He wasn't even a, a state fan, so I know it was just for me, but that's how he showed me how proud he was. And I hope he doesn't mind if I steal that quarter zip before I go to college. <laughs> it might be one of the only things I can salvage from his closet. It's, just, it's well known that he didn't have the best fashion sense, but unless 20-year-old soccer shorts with paint stains come back in style. <laughs> 
but it's the moments like asking me to put together an outfit for him that I took for granted when he was here, but appreciate so much now that he's gone. And I learned recently that he was a Spartan in college. I'm proud to carry on the Spartan mm. legacy. I'll, I'll decide how proud I am after those college stories start slipping <laughs> out. <laughs> they won't. <laughs> Sorry. Um, his support goes beyond that. I remember being the kid in school who needed four people to carry my projects through the door. I would walk in and make eye contact with my teachers, and we both knew that I didn't lay a hand on it, <laughs> any of it. He loved teaching me how to use the tools so much that he forgave me pretty quickly for telling me about the two-week project the night before. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times he's offered to go first to get a shot just to show me I don't need to be scared of needles. He really used his own problems, like his anxiety, to, to calm others. And I can't tell you how many times he's restrained me from trying to find a nurse and held my hand through many other scary moments, always comforting and never recognizing my weaknesses. Dad could connect with just about anyone through soccer, and I'm sure that's why a lot of you are here today. I almost wore sambas to to mm -hmm. honor him, but it seems like, yeah, yeah it seems like it had some other people who had the same idea. He's coached me from day one and hasn't missed a game since, and I really mean that. Even on his lowest days, he would show up and support me, and there was nothing like a good, a good soccer game to put a smile on his face. Dad's happy place was making others happy. He loved to teach people things he was passionate about, especially soccer. But most importantly, he taught me how to love unconditionally. Before I would go, I would like to say a quick thank you to my mom. She's my rock and the strongest woman I know. And she truly supported my dad for better and for worse. And I hope you all got to see how much dad loves her. I would also like to thank my sister for keeping my dad's sense of humor alive. <laughs> and helping us smile through between the tears. Lastly, I would like to thank my family for being right by our side, even while dealing with their own emotions, and our friends for taking the time to honor Dad. I'm glad Dad got to make it to so many of my firsts, from my first steps to my first graduation. It hurts that I'll never get to see his smile again, but I know he'll be with me for the first I have yet to overcome. It's so hard to see someone you love struggling, and Dad has had a tough time these past few years. I wish he could have seen himself the way we all see him. I've prayed for him every night for a long time, and I ask you all to keep my dad and my family in your prayers now. There's a part of me that's angry that I didn't get the chance, that he didn't get the chance to get through this tough spot, and a part of me that feels that he's at peace now. I'll always love him and never forget the love that he showed me. Thank you. I don't know if anyone noticed, but I took my shoes off because they were uncomfortable, but I, I know my dad would have done the same if he wore heels, so. Sorry, I gotta actually pull up my speech real quick. Okay. My dad was not only a dad to me, but a coach who stayed besides, beside me on the sideline, having words with refs, who made bad calls and cheering me on, even when I would tumble across the court. He stayed beside me when I would pick up a new sport and drop it just a year later, and that happened quite often. <laughs> he always tried his best to understand and learn it with me. More than that, he was my friend. He would drive 66 miles from work straight to school to pick me up, while most days I just napped on the way home. Little did I know, that time with him was some of the most memorable. We talked about simple things, how our days went, or just how we were feeling that day. And even though his bipolar disorder had low lows and some wonderful highs, he made sure to call me every day. And while the calls would only last a minute or two, the last time I talked to him, he thanked me for picking up the phone every day. And I should have thanked him for calling every day, because while it may seem small, this was his way of showing his love to me when it's hard for him to even get out of bed in the mornings. I know that everyone here remembers him a little differently, but I think that we can all agree that he spread contagious laughter and joy when it was which, 
when he was with each one of us. So I'm Troy Brad's brother, and I actually had some things written down to say, but they were kind of already sold, said. Thank you. Um, so Connie, I guess I'll blame you for this. You wanted the girls to know Brad, and you didn't know his younger ages, and you wanted me to continue. So I guess I'll just share a story, which I hadn't planned on sharing. <laughs> um, When I first had a minute to kind of get a, my mind was clear to really think about what had happened. As I thought about my brother, there was one thing that popped in my mind that I don't know why it was the first thing, but it was. Um, my brother was just under three years uh, older than I was, which means, I guess, two things. We grew up together. And we fought. Normally, um, I guess, you know, we fought. It, that sounds like a bad word. It was normally, I guess, over, you know, whoever was not the banker accusing the banker of cheating in Monopoly. <laughs> and I say fight. It was more of a push or a wrestle. We never actually threw a punch. My parents think otherwise because we, uh, as soon as we would get on the ground, we would try and figure out who could get away the first to get up to mom or dad and say, Brad punched me. <laughs> the first question every time from either my mom or dad was, where? Here. <laughs> and then my brother would come up the stairs and he'd look at him and say, Brett, why'd you hit your brother? I was just defending myself. He hit me first. Where'd he hit you? Here? Always oh, just. So, anyway, I guess there were. When I was thinking uh, about this and kind of laughing and there were two stories in particular that came to mind. The first was, and I guess I have to kind of go through the setting, the house that we grew up in for the most part, we spent a lot of time in the basement and the basement was completely lined with 1970s wood paneling. And if my parents ever really looked closely at that paneling, they would have found a number of perfectly spherical dents. And that stemmed from one time we were playing bumper pool. Um, had a, obviously had a bumper pool table downstairs and we were, we were playing and of course after one or two many gentle nudges or hip checks to the pool to try and get each other's ball offline, we, of course, accused each other of cheating. And we looked at each other as only brothers would do and say, it's time to escalate. <laughs> so we both grabbed a couple of pool balls and just started chucking them at each other. Now, my, my dad was our, our coach, and he was a pitcher and coached both of us and taught us both how to pitch. So we were not exactly throwing lollipops at each other. The wood paneling took the brunt of it. The other story about this that came to mind was we also had a like old English dartboard in our basement that had nice heavy metal tipped darts. And we were playing darts one day and we always would 
keep score and announce it to each other after every turn. And one day it was, uh, became a disagreement on the score that we were announcing in our heads. And we decided to warm up our pitcher arms again. Only this time we had darts in our hand. So we decided it was a good idea to start throwing those darts at each other. There was only one that connected. That was to the back of my sister, <laughs> who was hiding under that bumper pool table nervously. I guess I share it with you. Um, We'd fight, but we never threw a punch. We threw pool balls, threw darts, never hit each other. Now, I guess you could believe that that's one of two reasons. One is my dad was our coach, and maybe we inherited his in his sense of accuracy. Uh, the second would be, we never wanted to hurt each other. We may have fought like brothers, but we loved each other like brothers. Karen asked me to read a poem that she found precious. I'm free. Don't grieve for me now. I'm free. I'm following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work, or play. Tasks left undone must stay that way. I found that place at the close of day. If my parting has left a void, then fill it with remembered joy, a friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss. Ah, yes, these things too I too will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life's been full. I savored much. Good friends, good times, a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart and share with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. I'm Elaine Schaefer, and this is my husband, Mark, and I have the honor of being Connie's sister. And oh, I just wanted to share with you um, about the time that I've thought of the most uh, that I shared with Brad this week as I thought about him. And um, we've had the immense pleasure and gift of living near Connie and Brad and the girls, before the girls were born, going on 20 years now, we've lived minutes apart. So our lives are intertwined on a almost daily basis. It's a beautiful thing. Um, when I retired from my medical practice quite a few years ago now, um, I was found myself in this strange role of being home, getting to be participating in my kids' world and seeing my husband again. Um, 
during some of those early years, Brad was also at home a lot during the day. He had some flexibility in his, in his job schedule, and so he and I got to spend a lot of time together. Um, I was over at the house all the time with our mom being there, and, um, and Brad and I had some really awesome talks. We, we s supported each other in our questions of what our role was in the world and are we enough, are we doing enough in what we're doing? And constantly we'd say to one another, yes, yes, this is, this is the most important work of the world. And um, we'd have, we believe it for the other one, but a hard time for ourselves as that goes sometimes. Um, you know, really, I think that I just want to say that I think Brad would want you all to know that you're enough. You know, whatever feelings you may have, am I doing enough in the world? Is what I'm doing worthwhile? It is. It really is. That's really when I, I feel like, you know, if there's a part of me that can channel Brad, um, he'd want you to hear that today. You're all beautiful, wonderful people, and love yourselves and appreciate what you're doing in the world. I, I want to say something in Brad's defense here, because I'm the oldest brother and couple are here and younger brothers often do cheat when they play games, when they're bankers, especially in Monopoly. But no, I'd like to say when, when I first met Brad, when these guys had just started dating, you know, I heard he was an athlete and all this and really cool guy. And if any of you have ever seen me play a sport, you're lying because I'm terrible. I can barely dribble a basketball, and I grew up in Indiana. But Brad never, that was never a thing. Even though he loved doing that stuff, he didn't judge you. You were just like Elaine said, who you were was enough to love. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to say that I have two really wonderful brothers, and Brad was like a third. He really was. His last, I lost a, a, a brother and a friend last Sunday. And I know that he was a really good man and I'm just honored to have gotten to be part of his life. We're going to do He Was a Friend of Mine. Um, there we go. Feel free to sing along. He was a friend of mine. He was a friend of mine. Every time I think of him, I just can't keep from crying. Cause he was a friend of mine. Never reaped all he could sow. 
was a friend of We want to make some time for you to share your stories, your affirmations, your blessings. You're welcome to come on up here, or if you raise your hand, I'll bring a mic to you. And part of the reason, don't, don't say, oh, you don't need the mic, you, you speak loud, because we've got people online that are listening to us too, so you're welcome. I'm uh, Jeff Schaefer, and uh, I didn't cheat. Mark, maybe Todd, who's not here, but uh, Mark's brother and Todd's brother and Brad, in fact, was like a brother. He was close to Connie and the girls and Barb, and uh, just shared a lot of fun times together and laughs and uh, enjoyed talking current events with Brad. Um, and then I just think of playing, uh, playing with our kids, uh, Teddy. We, we went out to California on a, on a trip, and we stayed in the same uh, cottage as they did. And uh, just a lot of uh, chasing around the house with uh, Teddy and Brad. And uh, so we spent a day trying to figure out ways to get bad brat back. So we found a little pen that squirted water. So... The rest of that day was trying to find and sneak up on Brad and squirt him with water with the pen. So, and then just uh, seeing the picture with uh, our youngest Violet and Brad holding Violet. So just very, and thank you for, thank you all for having us. <laughs> Thanks for your work and Connie and uh, girls who love you and we'll be with you. Um, so my name is Camilo and my wife Adriana. We are usually known as the people who lived with the Schaefers. Um, so I went to I went to school at Manchester University and I had a lot of time to share with Mark and Lane and Connie and Brad. And then I met Sophia and Harper when they were very little, and we've. We've, for multiple reasons, we've moved to South Bend and we've questioned a lot of times why, why we had to move here. And we've been able to join 
your family in some really happy moments, but we've also been allowed to be with you in really sad days like Sunday. And we are very happy that we got to share with you and Brad uh, on Friday night and um, see him laugh and enjoy. Adriana was just telling me how she remembers that he was always so concerned about how our country was, um, how we were doing. And Adriana was remembering yesterday the, the night she met him for the first time. Um, and so Adriana fixed dinner for Andrew and Cody who were taking off and Brad show, showed up. Uh, Connie and the girls were in Florida and Adriana offered some of the Nicaraguan food she had prepared and Brad said, no, I already ate. And then he said, okay, well, I'll just have a little bite. And then he ended up sitting and having dinner with us. And so uh, that was really fun. We just wanted to say that um, we loved you, that Brad was a, a great friend. Uh, even if, you, if you've known him for your whole life or just a couple years or um, a couple months, And so we're we're here with you, and we love you, Sophia Harper. I'm Kimberly uh, Cozan, and I'm a friend of Brad's from college. And um, I just appreciate the witness that, <laughs> that of the stories that really are true, that there was an open table wherever he was. Um, I marveled at the breadth of skill he had from uh, chopping for cooking in a <laughs> with such dexterity that I was, you know to the excitement of putting in geothermal to invasive species uh removal and uh bringing life um they're just that renaissance man um who um I admire in a lot of ways especially for the way that he shows us how to remember to be in relationship and to love and um I'm grateful for his impact on my life and, and I'm just not surprised at all at how so many people felt like he was a good, good friend because of the way that he loved and lived. Um, I've been hearing his laughter and messages of being truly at peace and um, my life is richer for him. I'm grateful. Hi there, everyone. I am one of those people. So Brad spent a little extra time in college because of all of his. And I wouldn't have met him if he hadn't. Um, so <laughs> it's part of his experience. You know, he, he, spread his, he spread his love around. Um, I do. I, I loved hearing all these stories because it is. It's the adventurousness and just all the things that he would try and maybe never the, the same way twice. We got to experience the death sledding tower. And I didn't think twice about it because Brad made it. I'm sure it's safe. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I was trying to figure out what story do you tell about Brad. And I think one of those is just the free spirit and the free. We were stopping by and he wanted to make, we were there for a day maybe, and he wanted to make dinner for us. And he made us a soup, a stew, a something. And it was just amazing. And Connie said, you should write this down. And he said, I've made this before. <laughs> She said, no, Brad, you haven't. So it's not that he hadn't tried, it's just everything had to be different, everything was new, everything was exciting with Brad.
I'm Dan, and I, Dan Smith, um, also got to know Brad at college, and like uh, many people, first met Brad playing soccer at Manchester. But Brad was in Garver, and I lived in Eikenberry, so outside of soccer, we didn't really do anything. And so it wasn't until a few years later that we started um, getting to know each other better. I know you were interested in hearing some stories, so these are ones that are kind of special to me. Um, and actually, as one of the hosts of this infamous Groundhog Day party, I'd like to take a little bit of credit for this beautiful family. Uh, one of my most um, proud accomplishments at Manchester uh, was uh, actually co-directing and arranging a, a one-act play with Brad. And I don't know if he's ever mentioned it to you, but it's very special to me. It was the non-authoritative Calvin and Hobbes, in which we pieced together a series of the day in the life of Calvin and Hobbes, Brad and I, and of course, Connie was cast as Calvin's mother, sort of classic case of director casting girlfriend, <laughs> something like that. And uh, we had Peter Loomis as Calvin. Some of you know Peter. He was sort of the quintessential college student, Calvin. If anybody represented Calvin, that was Peter. Um, but that was special. And then after that, Kimberly invited us to come be counselors at Geneva Center together. So we had a summer where Brad and Connie and I and Kimberly were all together at Geneva Center. And if Brad were here, we'd show you a little bunny foo foo <laughs> and the good fairy. And if Michael Brown were here, we'd probably try and show you something called body laps. Um, but Brad was somebody that I counted as really special as a friend to me. And uh, that's why when I went off to Poland in Brethren Voluntary Service, um, and you guys had asked me to participate in the wedding, I was sort of like, that's terrible that I'm going to be gone. So I didn't uh, let the distance stand in the way of coming back and being present in the wedding. And then they did me the honor of backpacking all the way to Poland and visiting me while I was there. So that was kind of amazing. And then a couple years later, getting married at Camp Mac, where you guys were there, we did you the favor of coming to see you on our honeymoon in Chicago. <laughs> Um, I'm really going to miss Brad. You guys are both so special to me. My name's Ken Stuff. Just a real brief thing. We uh, we came back into Elkhart at 83. Uh, family lived down the street from the mix. And uh, where we came from, they played basketball. My son couldn't find anybody to play basketball with, and so they said, well, we can, can he play soccer? And Doug was a soccer coach. And uh, so Doug started working out my son, and he kind of, he called up, he called us, so I said, boy, he's really fast. We can use him. Can you talk him into playing soccer? Well, that was my son and Brad was the same age. So short story is uh, they played soccer in high school. And their traveling team went down to state. And I think they got beat by Bedford or Carmel by a couple goals. And, and those people down there had been playing soccer for a long time. And those kids played their heart out. And they both went to Manchester. And they did the same thing there they played in. The thing I could say about Brad, he always gave 100%, and we lost, we lost a good young man early, and it really hurts. And I really pray for you guys. Love you very much.
Hi, uh, my name is Ben Jarman. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, and uh, had a few connections with the Schaefers. Uh, they mentored me in my career, and, um, and so I'm appreciative of that. And then I also I knew Brad. Um, also, a, uh, I'm also the uh, youngest son, and definitely lied um, about my interactions with my older sisters. And Brad knew both my sisters as well, so a lot of a lot of interactions. But all that interaction came at uh, during Manchester College. Um, I was a freshman when Brad was, I think, a junior or I think so. Um, he was in Garver Hall. I was in Eikenberry Hall. Um, and there, if to, I think, and I haven't talked to Brad since 1995, um, but he's got the personality exactly that pulls people back to events like this. And uh, it just transcends uh, time, uh, moments, and relationships. So, um, Sophia, to your point um, about college stories, um, the, uh, the only thing I, the thing that popped in my mind early on when I thought about this whole thing was uh, beer and Cheerios. Um, I'd never had beer and Cheerios before I met Brad. <laughs> it was a one-time thing, not something you should try, but, um, but it, it was instantly part of my memory of, uh, of some of the stories with Brad that were just so uh, fun um, throughout college years. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about seriously was just... Um, you know, when you're in college and you have all these different social groups and cliques, and uh, uh, Manchester was not short of that. Um, even within dormitory halls, you had Eikenberry Hall, you had Garver Hall, you had Schwalm Hall. Um, and it, it was amazing that Brad just transcended all of those groups. Um, and so uh, I think even to the point that the Eikenberry Hall, we used to have a serenade of the um, female uh, dorms in the, on the campus. And actually, Brad crossed lines to Eikenberry and actually performed with us, uh, with Sean leading the course uh, a couple of times. So, um, so those groups you had the uh, you know the um, the writers, you had the the the, the the theatrical group, you had the partiers, you had the athletes. Um, all those groups Brad was a part of with just this endless energy. At the same time, could just focus and have deep conversation about uh, really important things um, with you. So. Um, just an impactful person. So I'm just uh, fortunate I had the chance to, to know him. Friends, I think we'll um, have more chance to share at, at the dinner afterward. Uh, I, I thank you so much for for the stories. Would you bow your heads with me so we can pray together? God, we celebrate Brad the contagiousness of his spirit it reminds us of that time when Jesus was talking to the crowds and people were bringing their children to Jesus and the disciples were like oh no we we got to keep them away. They're going to interrupt what's going on. And Jesus said, bring them. It's to such as these that the kingdom belongs. If Brad had been a disciple, he would have stopped them. He would have stopped them from stopping the kids because he understood. God, we celebrate Brad's curiosity and wonder and kindness and gentleness that's born of wisdom. And we pray for your comfort now as we share in our grief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, we're going to sing together verses 1, 3, and 4 from My Life Flows On. And I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as you are able. Friends, intense grief can leave us feeling like the world is going on without us, that we're left to suffer on our own. But Brad showed us that we can move through this world with the eyes of our hearts, enlightened by the pain and joy of others, emboldened to harness that power to be love's presence for any who are hurting. And so I bid you go in truth, knowing that you are loved, Go in faith, confident that we are in this together. And go in hope, because Brad lives in us. Amen. You may be seated for our benedictory song. I will be glorious. 
Don't you cry for me, don't you pity my sorry soul. What pain there might have been will now be past and my spirit will be whole. I'll be on my way. I'll be on my way. I have left my feet of clay upon the ground. I will be glory bound. I'll be on my way. Oh. 